Hey everyone, welcome for week 16. We have two more to go this week and next week, and then we're done. Week and a half. We can do this. <clears throat> so for this week, we're going to be looking at viruses, which are a weird aspect of life, but they're kind of important. Whether they're alive or not is a different story, but we kind of need to talk about them. We'll then look at plant and animal diversity. That's going to be three pieces or parts. And then we're going to introduce ecology. That'll be two, so there'll be a total of five parts for this week. You have a worksheet due on Saturday. And then your final quiz will be due this Saturday. So we'll have a quiz this week. Nothing next week. The following week will be the final. The lab is only going to be for the Tuesday class, and that's going to be eukaryotic diversity. We'll have the last quiz. So the Thursday class already had an additional quiz. They were up one quiz compared to Tuesday. So it all evens out. This last lab will be due on Saturday. It is a group lab because the one that the Thursday class did that the Tuesday class didn't was also a group lab. For the Thursday lab, your lab final is from 9 to 12. You get one shot at it. If you miss the time slot, you just don't get a score. So it's online, don't come to class. So for part one, we're looking at the second half of the diversity of life. So we're gonna look at viruses. So you should be able to describe the structure and application of viruses, then what they do. First thing of note is viruses are everywhere. So this is actually taking just samples of seawater and then analyzing the water. And there's viruses throughout seawater. We can go into the sky and we can find viruses. Everywhere we look, we will find viruses. So they are worth, you know, a little bit of study. Whether you think they're alive or not is irrelevant because they're everywhere. From your textbook. Viruses are acellular or parasitic entities that are not classified with any domain because they're not considered to be alive. What they seem to do is they oscillate between being alive and not alive. So they have two phases. They have a non-living dormant stage. Then they seem to have a parasitic intracellular quote living phase or stage so does this mean they're alive don't know and it gets further complicated by the fact that we're not sure where they come from when we look at viruses they have one requirement and then we can kind of build up from there they must have genetic material. That genetic material will be either DNA or RNA. So this is required. If they have more than that, the next phase would be they have a capsid, which is a protein coat, which is what we call again that capsid. Again, they could be DNA or RNA based. Some of these caps encapsulated protein or viruses can have an envelope. So they're gonna have lipids we switched the name of the capsid to being called a nucleocapsid, which means if you look at this figure here from your text where it says capsid, that's technically not right. This is actually called a nucleocapsid. And then it'll have its DNA or RNA. So we can have three different varieties, genetic material only, protein genetic material, lipid protein genetic material. There's a gentleman by the name of David Baltimore. He won the Nobel Prize. Baltimore. Who came up with a scheme of classifying viruses based upon what they need to do. So they have double-stranded DNA viruses, single-stranded DNA viruses, plus-stranded RNA, single-stranded RNA viruses, plus-strand meaning this is the strand that they use for gene expression, you could have negative or minus stranded RNA viruses, or it's the strand that we would call the template strand. 
so it's not the one that is actually used in transcription. You would actually need to, get, or excuse me, for translation. So you'd actually have to make another copy of it and then continue. You could also have plus stranded RNA that actually goes, has to go from RNA to DNA back to RNA, which obviously gets all sorts of screwy. And then we have other variations, even not even included in this picture. So there's lots of options as to what viruses seem to do. We usually like to say that viruses are small, but that's not actually true. So we actually have viruses like this one here called the Mimi virus, which is 400 nanometers in diameter. The smallest cell is 100 nanometers in diameter. So this is a virus four times the size of the smallest known cell. So saying viruses have to be small for them to be viruses is not true. It's kind of like saying prokaryotes are always smaller than eukaryotic cells, when we can actually find prokaryotic cells that are bigger than eukaryotic cells. When they replicate, it kind of does get a little bit complicated and there's no point in pretending. One thing that seems to be always required is they require host machinery, meaning they need the host's parts for them to replicate. What they then have is once they break in is they have to make a decision. Do they either stay inside the cells when they replicate or do they replicate and leave? If they stay inside the cells, we call this the lysogenic cycle, and they just stick around with you. If they choose to leave the cells, that's what we call the lytic cycle. Not all viruses can do both. Some are, sp if you do the lysogenic cycle, you have the option of going into the lytic cycle, but if you exclusively do the lytic cycle, the lysogenic cycle is not for you. We associate viruses with disease and being parasitic. Usually the disease that we see is due to viral damage to our cells and our immune response, which is somewhat weird. We think it's the virus, but it's actually us responding to them. They're also capable of rapid change, which is to say they rapidly evolve. So whatever defenses or drugs we can come up with, they're probably going to evolve out of it really fast. This figure here shows a bunch of viruses and diseases that are associated with viruses. So anything goes after your brain, so encephalitis or meningitis, which is the coating around your brain. There's a bunch of viruses that do that. Common cold viruses. You can have some that go after your um, gingiva. Uh, you can have something that goes after your pharynx, which is the tube behind your throat in your nose, you have eye infections, you can go after your parotid glands in your cheeks, pneumonia, we could have things that go on inside of your digestive tract that ultimately can end up potentially harming your nervous system. We have heart things, we have liver damage, we could have skin damage, we have STDs, technically they're more like STIs, HIV is more an STD, we can go after the your pancreas or your intestinal tract. There's viruses for everything. What makes it even stranger is when we look at our genome, components of our genome turn out to be virus-like. So these turn out to be what we call transposable elements. So DNA transposons, long terminal repeat, retrotransposons, lot, signs and lines. So small inverted uh, nuclear elements and long inverted nuclear elements. When we look at these, they compose approximately 44% of your DNA. And these are virus-like, meaning they can have components that make us think virus. We don't know if our DNA made these things, made viruses or viruses infected our cells. We don't know, and it's an impossible experiment to replicate because it's done for. But needs to say, 
they're kind of all over the place. They're worthwhile investigating. Although I made them out to be bad guys, they're not always necessarily bad. What we're going to look at next are going to be the plants.